This river is unique. A hundred and sixteen kilometers teeming with life. The untamed Vupa, the home of innumerable fantastic species, both in and around the water. This is a stage for all the facets nature has to offer, almost like its South American cousin, the Amazon. This is a special river in the Bergisch Land, the heart of the western part of Germany. The Wupper, the pulsing artery of the Bergisch Land. But it was not always well cared for by people. The Münsterner Bridge and the world famous suspended monorail in Wuppertal still bear witness to determined entrepreneurial efforts to take control of nature and the countryside. In the Middle Ages, it was the Dukes of Berg who resided in the castle called Schlossburg. These dukes kept a watchful eye on the river Wuppe, for good reason. In those days, the 13th century, the crystal clear, unsullied waters of the river were a plentiful source of tasty fish. Due to their excellent quality, trout and salmon from the river were particularly coveted. North of Cologne, the Wupper joins the Rhine. By this time, it will have meandered 116 kilometers from its source in the southern part of the Sauerland, shrouded in myth. According to legend, a gnome king plunged his staff into the ground here and cast a spell over the source. The marshy undergrowth, with its myriad of rivulets, encourages the myth of the river's magical origins. We may have no evidence of enchanted princes, but there are still plenty of enchanting amphibians around. As spring breaks, the pregnant European fire salamanders come out of their winter hiding places. This female has found a suitable place to give birth to her larvae. As soon as they hit cold water, the babies are independent. Fire salamanders live on land, but the females will find their way to water to give birth to their larvae. After a few months spent living in the water, the larvae will metamorphose into young salamanders and leave the streams. The striped salamanders feel particularly at home on the soft, mossy cushions in the damp, cool, deciduous woods that line the Vupa. They are seldom seen as openly as this, though, because despite being slightly poisonous, fire salamanders do have predators. The tawny owl, for example. The heath-spotted orchid is often called the vupa orchid. Here on the upland moors near Berlinghausen is the source of the Wupper, a veritable refuge for rare plants and animals.
a place steeped in its own magic. With its colorful fauna and flora, the Cradle of the Wupper is one of the most beautiful wetland habitats in the Bergish land, and is even a nature conservation area. More than 30 springs feed into this young river. The cold water, with its high oxygen content, is packed with insect larvae and water fleas, ideal feeding conditions for the great crested newt. This particular species has become rare in other locations. Spring fever does not only affect frogs and dragonflies. The beginning of May is also the breeding season for grass snakes. This snake wedding is a phenomenon rarely observed. After mating, the two go their separate ways again. The male has now done his duty in mating with the female. The swamp woods close to the river are just what these snakes, who love water, really relish. Later on in the summer, the females will lay up to 50 soft-shelled eggs in the muddy soil. The heat generated by decomposition is enough to hatch the eggs after around one and a half months. Around the stream below the source are meadows. This is one of the rainiest parts of Germany. There's no shortage of water here. In the upper reaches, the bed of the stream is very much the way nature made it. At this point, the river, in its early stages, is still called the Wipper rather than the Wupper a linguistic shift. The developing river drops rapidly from its source 441 meters above sea level. At this rate of current, the grass snake keeps well into the bank. It doesn't like fast flowing water at all. But on the other hand, there is prey in reach. The grass snake likes nothing better to eat than a water frog. These snakes are non-venomous, but they have very powerful jaws. And this one is going to make a meal of the large frog. Further downstream lies the breeding ground of a pair of kingfishers. The gentleman is in the process of getting ready for today's big event. His lady friend has appeared from inside the nesting hole. He aims to make this little lady happy. Just have to pick up a little present. That helps to cement the relationship. This attractive hunter is the master of his trade. This is why he has a family. It's important to hold the fish in such a way that she can take it by the head first. He seems to have done everything right. In the nesting hole, the chicks are calling because they're hungry. And the next course is on its way. Down here below ground, the chicks are safe from most predators. 
and cloud bursts, which can be dramatic here in the Bergish land. The Wupper and the weather are a constant topic of conversation, and not only an academic one. In some parts of the region, average annual rainfall can be 1,400 litres per square metre, possibly a record in Germany. Nature is prepared for this. When the heavens open, the water can't simply soak in. Now the peaceful hilly region river becomes a raging torrent. This is of no great concern to the chaffinch and yellowhammer. As soon as the high water has subsided, the latent power of the vipper becomes evident. Wild and unpredictable, but also peaceful and romantic, this artery flowing through the Bergish land has many facets. The white-throated dipper is well able to deal with the waves on the vipper. White-throated dippers are the only indigenous songbirds that hunt their prey on the bed of a river. Caddisfly larvae are an absolute culinary highlight of these feathered predators. The cases of the larvae have a very resilient structure, but are no protection against this sharp beak. Dippers crisscross the bed of the river, partly swimming, partly walking. They disappear and then suddenly appear again somewhere else, like a goblin. The fruit growing regions of the Bergish land, well known throughout Germany, are home to a different kind of goblin. The squirrel tailed dormouse wastes no time in discovering the rich choice of fresh fruit close to the river. As an accomplished climber, he will devour almost anything, from bark and leaves to eggs and fledglings, but a ripe apple is a real delicacy. The summer is drawing to a close and autumn is approaching. A contemplative calm settles over the course of the river and yet nature is not yet ready to sleep. In the neighbouring woods, numerous shy and not-so-shy residents are highly active. There is much to do along the riverbanks for the wild boar. Body contact is in demand during the siesta. If you roll around in the mud, your skin is likely to itch sometimes. But the plentiful supply of acorns, beech nuts and other titbits in the marshy ground are evidently worth such minor discomfort. In the river itself, there is considerable activity, even if this is hardly noticeable at first glance from a distance. The grayling are swimming in the current, 
These are now the most important fish species in the Vipa, and they're a river trout. Close to the bank, something is moving. A neat cut with the egg tooth, and the young grass snake is able to leave the leathery shell of his egg. The last few days in September. The black spruce are guaranteeing their next generation. The puffball and other mushrooms are busy spreading their spores. Everywhere, mushrooms are thrusting their heads upwards. Witches' eggs give rise to common stinkhorn and Australian octopus stinkhorn. The greater red slug knows exactly what treats the mushroom season brings. November in the Vipa. The sun-dependent algae now die off. The European catfish is out hunting. It must be this burbot's lucky day. The mouse-eared bats have made a disused ore mine from the 19th century their upside-down home. In this frost-free subterranean retreat, the temperature and humidity remain virtually constant, ideal winter quarters. The high level of moisture in the air prevents the surroundings drying out. Outside in the open countryside, on the other hand, moisture is causing a mystical metamorphosis in the river and plant world. The sudden drop in temperature is forcing many to seek refuge under the crystalline canopy in a silent, wintry world. The robin can't afford to be choosy. For most of the inhabitants of the woods, hard times are approaching. Especially those that are having to cope without their preferred, moderately tempered homes. Held in check between the white, cushion-covered banks, the Vipper is holding out against the winter, but only just. A red fox out hunting mice. Its fine senses locate the next meal under the snow. If a competitor encroaches on Reynard the Fox's territory, there's trouble. The rules are well defined. As the victor, he takes what is now his, even though it's a poor reward. The frost is beginning to take over the river. But the stream does not want to give in voluntarily to the icy clutches. When the last open stretches finally freeze over, such fishing experts as the grey heron will have to find other waters. 
For the buzzard, this will also probably be the last chance for a fish supper. Anchor ice is developing, a rare natural phenomenon that has not been seen here for decades. The vipper, usually nimble and light of foot, is freezing from the inside outwards. To avoid the deep snow, this secretive animal swings from tree to tree in search for food. Hardly visible during the periods of lush vegetation, he is highly noticeable in the bleak winter woodlands. Raccoons originated in North America, but have become firmly established in the Bergish land. As an omnivore, this newcomer is not very choosy, but he does enjoy a nice trout. One year blends into the next. The winter releases its hold. Slowly but surely, the countryside brings forth new life. On the first warm day, a pair of greater spotted woodpeckers appears. While he busies himself with building a home, she demolishes a rotten branch in her search for hidden insects. We are now at the beginning of March and the wedding season for common frogs. Common frogs spawn earlier than all the other amphibians. The female will lay up to 4,500 eggs in one or two gelatinous masses. Partners will usually come together in the water. Spring awakens in the water meadows around the Wipperfurt area. From here on, the river is called the Wupper. As the sun warms the countryside, a feeling of optimism takes hold of the river. The grayling are affected by spring fever. The males with their flag-like dorsal fins are attempting to win the favors of the female. One of them has been successful. She lays her eggs in a gravelly depression and covers them with sand. Despite the peaceful appearance of the vupper along this section, springtime on the riverbanks can be a time of stress for many of the inhabitants. These fox cubs have been allowed outside their earth but they're made to stay in the immediate vicinity of their parents' earth. But still, great fun for the cubs. But less so for the vixen. The spotted woodpecker parents have their beaks full, keeping their young fed. High up in a beech tree, young black woodpeckers are waiting for their breakfast. Mum delivers on time. A barn owl crosses the vupa which has by now reached impressive dimensions. It meanders snake-like between the hills and through the Bergish land. Guided by natural or re-naturalized riverbanks with numerous quiet backwaters, the Vupa has proved to be a paradise for many animal and plant communities, both above and below the water.
The submerged floral world of the Vupa Reservoir is a mystic one. The undisputed lord of the territory is a ghostly giant, a one-meter European catfish. These predators can reach a length of three meters. This particular caring father is keeping a watchful eye on the spawn. This is a mysterious, sinister world a place the catfish likes to frequent because the thick vegetation provides excellent cover. Although he's normally to be found at the bottom of the reservoir, this giant of a fish is partial to unwary swimming water birds. The coot must be careful. This pair have built themselves a floating castle from branches and twigs. The children left alone at home. After only three or four days, coot chicks can leave the nest. Despite being mature so early, they still have something to learn when it comes to eating. The parents share the tasks of nest building, brooding, and bringing up the young together. They may be courageous and keen to explore, but it will take around eight weeks before they're independent of their parents' feeding. The dab chicks are extremely busy looking after their young. If danger threatens, they're allowed to hitch a ride on the parent's back. But laziness is not to be tolerated. The family feels safe in the shallow water close to the reeds. These two crested grebe are in the process of planning a family. Two's company, three's a crowd. But the problem is soon solved. These two have come to an agreement. Mating takes place on the waterbed. This nest is floating and lightly anchored. When it dives, the crested grebe controls movement with its fin-like feet. He's out hunting. Besides slugs and insect larvae, he most appreciates fish. The little water shrew is equally at home on land and underwater. It's a most accomplished diver. Its main prey is fish, but it will also catch invertebrate mollusks, which it stuns with its toxic saliva. Its high rate of metabolism requires it to eat more every day than its own body weight. When it comes to disputes, the 20 gram featherweights turn out to be energetic fighting machines. Less a fighting machine than an eating machine. 
the grub of a cockchafer sees daylight for the first time after spending several years underground. This is also an inhabitant of the Bupa Banks. With the aid of his sensitive scent detectors, he soon finds a female. But this female is not interested. She's hungry. In the woods beside the bank, the fox cubs have sneaked out of the earth to play. The mother is obviously away. As long as they are still small, they will come out during daylight hours. It's hardly possible to fool around in the restricting earth. Hide and seek is only really fun during daytime. At the latest, after 10 months, this will have to cease. Then they will be adults and have to be more careful. But before they transform into strictly nocturnal predators, the young cubs are thoroughly enjoying a life without responsibilities in the sunny woods by the Vupa. The Vupa Reservoir, built between 1974 and 1987 to help regulate high water levels. This reservoir is a complete world of its own. In 1989, the hamlet of Krewinkel was submerged. The remains of the buildings are now on the floor of the reservoir. Before it was flooded, everything in the village was thoroughly cleared up. There are unlikely to be any treasures left to find here. Today, the catfish are the lords over these old walls. Before the waters flooded everything, tall buildings were knocked down, but there are still a few aids to orientation. As if from nowhere, suddenly a pike perch appears. He obviously feels this diver is an intruder. This male is defending his spawn. His teeth are impressive. In the meantime, a perch feasts on the distracted pike perch's spawn. These fish and others have become well established in the artificial lake. After the valley was flooded, the water had to be restocked with fish. The fish could not repopulate the river naturally from downstream because the dam blocked their way. Nobody had to restock these. Wherever there are fish, there will soon be cormorants. In contrast to ducks, cormorant's feathers soak up water. This enables them to dive very efficiently, where they are successful underwater hunters. They are the sworn adversaries of fish farmers and many anglers. There are two nesting colonies of these fish catchers around the Vupa Reservoir. To convince the female of inherent qualities, the male bats his wings, presents his beak, and spreads his tail feathers. The method works, as we can see. Soon, the couple will be brooding over three or four eggs. The Vupa is also home to true everyday feathered heroes. This white-throated dipper, for example, that will traverse walls of water for its children.
Concealed in the woodlands by the river is an ornithological highlight. It takes an expert to recognize that these downy nest inhabitants are in fact young black storks. These rare, timid woodland birds are only to be found in a few places in Germany. Here, by the Wuppe, they find ideal conditions. Not until late in the summer will they migrate to Africa in search of warmer climes. The smaller reservoir near Bayernburg was built in 1953 to regulate high water levels. Today, it's a paradise for Canada geese and other waterfowl. Canada geese originate from North America, but have established themselves well beside the Wupper. The parents and their young exhibit tremendous appetites as they feed on the fresh vegetation of the Wupper meadows. African Egyptian goose must be the offspring of escaped zoo inhabitants. Whether they are classified as migrants or indigenes, it makes no difference. On the Bayernburg Reservoir, the various waterfowl all feel completely at home. Tufted ducks, on the other hand, are true Europeans. The species has been spreading further southwards. Two cootcocks have got into a dispute and are solving it by kickboxing. On the meadows close to the Wupper, grey herons go hunting for frogs and other small animals. The heron populations have increased considerably. There are now several colonies of these large grey birds on this section of the river. Wuppertal, the town on the Wupper, has forced the river into a tight corset. Above the river is the world-famous suspended monorail. It also crosses the island where the courthouse is. Thanks to renaturalization activities by the authorities, this is a bridgehead of nature. There are now grayling living in this part of the Wupper again after a long absence, a sign of excellent water quality. However, despite the green banks, the Wupper in Wuppertal is still an urban river. Go a few kilometers downstream and things are far different. Khoipu have made the Vupa their home. Normally, these South American rodents are to be found by the Amazon. Since around 1930, the offspring of a few escaped fur farm detainees are to be found in Germany. Many of them will not survive a really tough winter. The Wuppe, the Amazon of the Bergisch Land. Purified of sewage and treated, Wuppe water is once again the elixir of life. Even the noble crayfish, once thought extinct, is reproducing again here. The mating of these small-scale lobsters is a spectacle that raises hopes. No sign anymore of what used to be more a cesspool than a river. Today, the course of the River Wuppe is one of the most beautiful countryside elements in the region. 
The many species of dragonflies make full use of heavily overgrown quiet backwaters for their courtship and egg-laying. But many aquatic plants are not as harmless as they appear. The bladderwort looks soft and filigree, but it's extremely dangerous for such small creatures as water fleas. It uses special bladder-like traps to suck in plankton-like organisms and digest them. In the woodlands close to the river, we can also find eagle owls. This female eagle owl has chicks. Her simple nest depression is in a nearby niche in the rocks. Children are always hungry. To keep their insatiable chicks fed, it's even necessary for these nocturnal hunters to go out in the daylight. The Wupper between Remscheid and Zollingen. At this point, the valley of the Wupper is crossed by Germany's highest railway bridge, the 107 meter high Münsterner Brücke. At the foot of this bridge, called locally the Bergisch Eiffel Tower, badgers have dug themselves a set in the hill. A rare occurrence, badgers during daylight hours. As a rule, these stocky animals are only nocturnal. It looks very much as if the afternoon's playtime is drawing to a close, a plan not supported by the young badger cub. But mother has given in again. It'll be evening soon anyway. As darkness falls, this colossal steel construction becomes the stage for a mystic but beautiful activity. This is when the nocturnal spirits in the neighboring rocky walls of the Wupper Valley wake up. Around the Wupper, there are 10 to 15 different species of bats. One of these is Dorbenton's bat. Up in the rafters of a nearby barn, there's nervous expectancy female mouse-eared bats ready to give birth. This one is ready. A baby mouse-eared bat appears in the darkness of its mother's summer quarter. Initially, baby bats are naked and blind but still strong enough to hold tight and seek the teats. The morning after, now we take our leave of the bridge. Close to the castle, Schlossburg, the Wupper shows its original nature. The fast flowing water is rich in oxygen, like in the Middle Ages, as the Dukes of Berg watch suspiciously from the high walls of the castle to guard their well-stocked river. But it was not only fish they were interested in. Crayfish were also popular, but they were wiped out later by the crayfish plague. 
the American replacement has caused many problems. The Dukes of Berg would probably have been in two minds about this one. They might have been pleased that the foreign invader was eating up the undesirable crayfish, but they would also have been concerned that the raccoon loves to hunt the newly returned trout, and they are no doubt as delicious now as they were 800 years ago. Balkhauser cotton can look back over a 500-year heritage. This cutlery and blades workshop, now a museum, demonstrates today how the world-famous blades from Zollingen were ground using water power. On the bed of the river in front of Bauchhauser cotton, large freshwater mussels filter tiny organisms and other nutrients from the waters of the Wupper. As it plows its way through the riverbed, it turns up tiny particles that it can then eat. The bitterling male has chosen this mussel as the backdrop for his wedding. A central point is the aperture through which the mussel sucks in water from which it obtains oxygen and food. In the meantime, the bitterling male has been able to attract a female to his muscle. The female extends her long ovipositor into the mantle cavity of the muscle and deposits her eggs there, while he ejects his sperm into the muscle's inherent water current. Fertilization takes place within the host. At Vipper Cotton, there is the last opportunity to watch the knife grinding that shaped the Bergish region in real life. It's nearly time for the workshop to close, but nobody even thinks about what's happening in front of the building in the shallows. The night shift has arrived at the Wupper, and they have plans. For the pike, it's just business as usual, but the eel has a remarkable plan. Heavily moist nights are good for eels. The weir across the river prevents them getting to the upper reaches. But for an eel, this is not an obstacle, as long as the meadows on the bank are wet enough. It glides smoothly around such obstacles over land. By daybreak, though, it ought to be back in the water. Otherwise, the early heron catches the eel. They are also usually active at twilight or in the night. Little ringed plovers, interestingly the only plovers that breed on Germany's rivers. These sparrow-sized birds need sandbanks or gravel banks for their well-being. The Wupper can offer even these. the weir at Wupperhof. For many fish, this is the end of the line. Hardly any migrating fish can get past here. Sea trout, in particular, gather below this weir. Fortunately, there are suitable spawning grounds here. Tagged salmon have been noted in increasing numbers. A sure sign that the fish introduced into the Wuppa years ago have found their way home after migrating through the oceans. Mm. 
the Wupper, a fairy tale river with many facets, a key river for both people and nature in the Bergish land. The return of the trout to Borg is as much a Wuppa miracle as the returning salmon that are now spawning again in the renaturalized river. The Wuppa today has developed so many fascinating sides that one may be forgiven for giving it the nickname the Amazon of the Bergish land. There can surely be no greater compliment for this small but gigantic river.